Hi attendees, this is Bobby Harris from UVBA and we're going to hold just a moment so that everybody can get logged in. So if you'll bear with us just a moment, we'll get started shortly. All right, I have about three minutes after the hour, and I want to welcome everybody to the webinar, Next Generation AMI over Private LTE. This is a Burns and McDonald webinar hosted by the Utility Broadband Alliance. For uh, those of you who are not members of UVBA, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us at uvba.com for uh, any additional information. But without further ado, um, I want to introduce um, our panelists you see here on your screen. I'm actually going to turn off the slide and let you see the faces of your panelists. That will be more important, I think. And we will get straight into the webinar with our key folks. Chris, let me turn it over to you, sir. All right. All right. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, thank you to the UBBA for uh, presenting this opportunity for kind of a, an industry exchange here on something that's uh, some technology that's developing and and uh, uh, ready to, to, to start blossoming here. So it's a, a great opportunity to, to get the perspective of, of multiple people. We've got uh, a great panel uh, with a, uh, a depth of experience that have lived and breathed this uh, for a long time. So I'm interested in getting their perspectives. And let me go ahead and introduce the panel. We have Russ Ehrlich from a senior manager from Exelon on the Digital Grid UCOM Engineering Group. Russ has worked for Exelon and legacy utility companies for around three decades. His role and responsibilities range from marketing, power consulting, meter services, smart grid, asset management, and telecommunications, networking, and securing engineering support for Exelon operating companies. From the uh, perspective of an infrastructure provider, we have uh, Mauricio Subieta. Dr. Subieta is Nokia's energy CTO for North America. He leads the industry's cybersecurity program and is the technical lead for the private wireless networks, both LTE and 5G, for Nokia's enterprise division. That division is focused on energy segments, including electric utilities, oil, gas, and mining. And in addition to a distinguished academic career, his work experience includes almost a decade as security network architect of Oklahoma Gas and Electric, and has more than five years of supporting the oil and gas industry. Also on the panel, we have uh, perspectives from device and meter solutions from Honeywell, Kenny O'Dell. Kenny is the offering lead for Honeywell's electric business, in North America, with over 13 years in the electric utility space, involved with many. AMI vendors, and in that time, played a role in the development of over 25 electronic products. And from CrescoNet, John Stafford. John's the president of CrescoNet North America, CEO of CrescoNet subsidiary Smarta Technologies. John has a history of delivering large 20-year partnership deals to U.S. water, gas, and electric utilities. Notably, John served with Census USA for over eight years, including in the role of executive vice president for Census North America. So thank you to the panel for taking this time. My name is Chris Parison. Uh, I've got 20 years of experience in the telecom space uh, with Burns and McDonald, a project manager for private LTE and digital consulting projects 
including uh, some engagements with AMI and AMI uh, infrastructure. So very excited to have the panel. Uh, I made it a goal not to use the word excited too much, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I'm gonna do my best here to, uh, to try to avoid that. So a number of, uh, uh, as we we're pulling together some of the questions for the panel, uh, there's a lot of spaces. And uh, one of the comments that there is that we could probably pick one or two of those comments and probably have a, uh, uh, a webinar uh, on each of those topics. So we're gonna do our best to try to cover uh, a lot of different ground. Uh, and uh, we'll also try to uh, leave some room for questions there uh, at the end. So we'll see where it goes. But let me just go ahead and kick off uh, just by just kind of, kind of setting the table here of kind of the general questions. And one of the, the general parts of the reason why we're having a webinar now is that uh, there really is a confluence of some factors that are hitting the industry. And namely that we see that the, the initial deployment of smart meters that happened in the, the last 10 to 15 years are starting to age and they're starting to become a, a, a discussion about uh, replacement and upgrades of that period. And that discussion is happening at the same time with the emergence of private wireless networks, of, of wireless LTE technology in general, and specifically the emergence of private LTE. So these two things are happening uh, around the same time and represent that there could be a lot of, uh, a lot of potential value and, and potential changes that utilities need to consider. So let me go ahead and pose kind of a first question of the panelists, and I'll just go ahead and start with kind of a general one, and that is, that with the experiences learned with, uh, I'll call it AMI 1.0 or the initial deployment, what are some of the general benefits that, uh, that you're looking forward to for the next generation of smart meters on, on we'll call it AMI 2.0, uh, with the improved performance of a higher bandwidth connection? So, Russ, uh, I'll, uh, uh, maybe I'll start with you, kick that off, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, engage each of the panelists here as we go down. Thanks, Chris. Hopefully everybody can hear me as I got off mute. I, I think some of the big things, you know, the evolution of AMI from, you know, uh, whether it was sneaker net, the individual reads, the one-way meter reading, the two-way meter readings that you get, it all becomes data, you know, da data, more data, other things that she can do with, you know, we'll call it the gateway. We we kind of see these meters as becoming a gateway into homes, not only providing, we'll say from a metering technology, more granularity on interval metering, getting better data that helps support capacity planning or other reliability functions within a utility company. But now it starts to allow you to get into other uh, potential offerings or initiatives that were a little bit more difficult while it was there with some of the the home area networking technology that was there and the limited bandwidth that you had to work with on some of the meshing technologies in AMI 1.0. Uh, looking at this, you know, this next generation from a metering perspective is being able to offer, you know, additional value to a customer, you know, through that uh, endpoint device. Great. Very good. Let me see, uh, Mauricio. From a from an infrastructure perspective, what are some of the things that that you're looking forward to in supporting metering and and metering use cases? I think that what we've seen is an explosion of use cases that now want to be all handled uh, in a single technology. I think that. Uh, to the point that what Russ was making earlier, uh, a lot of the development from LTE, I mean, from AMI 1 to AMI 2, have been really driven by the technology that was required for other parts of the uh, utility on the distribution side. Distribution automation, I think, played a huge role. I remember my day back in OGME, where we were deploying networks, and, uh, well, we were covering quite a lot of the territory that AMI was also part of. And... Uh, the, the, the requirements moving from a lower latency, a higher availability from these other use cases were driving not only to deploy networks, in this case back in the day, independently for each of those use cases, but nowadays uh, we feel that convergence is the key. Convergence from not only having the growing pains of 
multiple technologies, some of those uh, being obsolete now, but also because of the uh, skill sets and the capacities that were required by the people that were running them, you know, just having too much spread of that. So now I feel that with the, with the private wireless LTE or 5G, that becomes uh, obviously a, a good technology to support the variety of these use cases and it's enabling uh, AMI 2.0 by bringing the technology, say narrowband IoT, for example, as we've seen some of the vendors, uh, as well as CAD-M, uh, that are already available for commercial deployments and really the, the utility will capitalize from that development done for the commercial carriers to be brought back into the private network. So that I think from an infrastructure perspective is the key enabler for this migration modernization, I would say swap from one to O to the to that O. And uh, uh, I think that more and more of the utilities uh, uh, that we talk to are ready to go on that change, not necessarily because of the obsolescence of their own meters, but just because the technology is right now in order to use it for multiple use cases. That's right. And I think I think the uh, a role of a foundational network in using AMI. Uh, it is a a use case a use case of additional use cases that go on the network and that the 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 p in private lte means that you'll have the control to be able to ba possibly balance and host that in a in an optimal way uh, that that's in in your capability not having to rely on on someone else's so that's important from the uh, from the device side or or from the device solution side uh Kenny and John, maybe Kenny, I'll start with you. Kind of that same general question of, of lessons from, from AMI 1.0 and how uh, a private wireless, uh, a private wireless or, or wireless network or, or larger bandwidth can be, how that might change and, and what you're looking forward to uh, in being able to accomplish with, uh, with the capabilities that are, are being now available or emerging. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, first thing that jumps in my head is we're not going to break meter reading. We all we all need meter reading. That's going to continue to work. But what we've challenged, been challenged by for the first decade and a half is how do we take care of the other half of the building? You make customer service happy, and that's good. But what about the distribution guys, the wires and poles guys? How can the AMI piece be leveraged to help them out? Um, and over all around the country, I've seen AMI be really, really focused on the billing um, maybe outage detection, and that's about it, but we should do a lot more. The meters have a lot more to say um, to help the distribution guy. And then on top of that, all your distribution automations pieces, you have to talk to them also. That, that's obvious, it needs to be on the same network. Um, but you, you can think of, you know, half of what a meter has to say is about normal metering, and, but the other half of what a meter has to say is really about DA. So it's like a multiple personality device. Well, let's tap into that other half of that brain and hook it into our distribution guys and use it. Um, having having LTE in general will make that possible. Making it private just gives a great deal more security and an ability for the utility to look out into the future and build what they need from a network perspective to, to service their requirements for, for a long time. And I think I think the 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 idea of, of doing something more of uh, if if all we were doing was going to replacing uh, the meter to cash function, then that problem has largely been solved. Uh, yep. And so the question is, what what more can be done? You've answered that question. Or is there something that can be done more efficiently or more effectively better? So I think that uh, uh, if you've answered that. So, John, let me let me pose kind of the same question to you uh, to kind of finish the uh, the first one here uh, and. Uh, uh, Kind of what you're looking forward to, and and what possibilities are of interest to you in CrescoNet? Yeah, sure. So uh, for sure, one of the biggest disappointments with AMI 1.0 is that uh, collectively the vendor kind of promises about it becoming a multi-application network never really materialized uh, to any uh, great degree. And the the super opportunity we have with LTE, both public and private. And the way I see most people now looking at the networks is they're not buying a metering network to do multiple things. They're, do, they're now buying a multi-application network of which metering is sort of one use case hanging off of uh, that network. From a regulatory perspective, a lot of the uh, benefits 
that uh, were already ripped out of the utility with AMI 1.0. So we don't get to reclaim the truck roll benefits and all of the, the remote disconnect benefits and all those things that we did with AMI 1.0. But now here comes DER and uh, the ability to put the to really put the uh, smart grid on the network. And not all that telemetry is going to run through the meter. You know, it's a multi application network. It's a network first. Some applications will be based on metering, but there's going to be a lot of telemetry come in across that network that doesn't really touch the meter and uh, a whole bunch of new use cases and recurring benefit streams. So uh, we see a lot of that. So so uh, I, I was I was going to save this question for a lightning round uh, a, a little later on, but, but since it's already come up and, and it's already been uh, referenced, uh, I, I think one part that's interesting to me as coming at it from more of a, a telecom and less, uh, a, you know, not a depth of experience on the metering side is, is Russ, you mentioned the, the meter as a, as a gateway. And, and so what the question would be, uh, how many devices or, or how many devices will a meter talk to in the house? So let's go ahead and, and project here in, in five, let's say, uh, I'll, I'll say 10 years. What, what are the devices that your meter, or, or what we used to call a meter, and now is probably a more multiple function, what devices is it talking to uh, and why? So let me, uh, so Russ, we'll go through this. We'll, we'll change the order, I promise. But Russ, we'll, we'll start with you again here on, uh, on that. So. Yeah, if I, I think if we had a crystal ball, you know, that would be a beautiful thing uh, sure. because I think that the, the piece that we heard was this this concept of 3GPP, this whole world of, you know, the capability of using, you know, that standardized technology that that could potentially enable a multitude of devices to be able to communicate through that uh, gateway or that meter for perspective. Uh, Having that capability, whether it be through, you know, smart appliances, whether it be through HVAC or other things, you know, the, I think the possibilities are are kind of, you know, I, I'd like to say there's a finite number, but it's almost limitless. What the next thing that somebody's going to develop and they're going to be able to come out with? You heard about the number of use cases. You know, this is just a. I mean, there's going to be many use cases that now. You know, a, a consumer could then go ahead and receive an offer from, let's say, a utility on. So, so instead of looking at it from the, and I'll say a number of things, I think you look at it as what are all the possibilities now that get opened up? Instead of having each, the same thing we talk about from a utility perspective, having multiple networks, multiple systems to be able to do different things. Now you come back with this private. LTE that's built on a standard solution. Granted, you know, depending upon what we've got from a bandwidth perspective, you'll have to we'll have to work through some of the the engineering design architecture pieces that are there. That's why we've got, you know, you know, panelists, manufacturers, and other folks, consultants who can help through that. Uh, but but you see it today with the world of you know whether it be uh, distributed energy resources, decarbonization programs, and a lot of things that utilities are starting to get involved with you know one could see this becoming a a a good way to to leverage public private type partnerships to be able to support bringing in more data to support distribution system operations and again reliability uh making sure that we can support a lot of the uh you know the, the clean energy laws and things that are coming down the pike so you know instead of kind of looking at it as a how many you know be, I kind of see it as a, you know, it's it's a big whiteboard that's out there that will enable, you know, hopefully uh, vendors, consumers, and other people to, to be able to help, uh, you know, kind of build onto these platforms. John or Kenny or, or Mauricio, any other any other uh, uh, thoughts on 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 that topic? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead. I have I have several. Uh, one of the things that we're preparing for is is a sort of a both scenario. One scenario is you need a higher capable NIC in the meter uh, that has multi-protocol routing that reaches into the home and reaches over to the DER devices and helps bring things back through the network. You know, one thing that's true is all utilities are different. 
and d different people are going to have different architecture views on how to approach that problem. But one thing we need to recognize as an industry is this DER market's moving with or without us. And uh, there's already lots of applications and lots of cloud systems talking to PVs and EVs that they have the and they are not running across the metering network today. So we can reach in and talk to those devices across the metering network. And, and in our case, we provide a NIC to do that. But uh, we also, you know, we just bought the world leader in uh, DER cloud-based applications that harmonizes other um, already pre-existing uh, DER solutions in the cloud so that if it's coming across in an already existing application, the utility can still see it and can still manage it. And it may run through the metering network in some cases, or it may run through the existing uh, solutions that are getting deployed in the marketplace at pace and at scale today. I think the, the what, what, what I'm struck by is, is also that uh, the additional data that we're talking about, uh, you know, is is obviously different from the the meter to cash, the meter reading. What what powers that? So so as we talk about increasing, you know, something the the, the communication network, we're also talking about what happens at the head end and the uh, uh, kind of flattening or democratization of the data that's coming back. It's no longer belonging to just one device or for one, one application, but now we're seeing more and more uses of that and that the, the IT configurations that in order to do that need to change as well. And, and these things don't change overnight, right? That the, the, this, is, this is something, especially if it's touching billing, that these are evolutions that take place over many years. It's not, it's not a month's or a, uh, a, a simple drop in and, and walk away kind of thing, but it's uh, something that's planned and, and evolves over a long period of time. Uh, now that I've made a very long statement here, I, 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 Kenny, maybe maybe I, I might have taken some air here. Uh, maybe you can comment too well, about the, some I'm, of that. I'm, I'm thinking about DER, um, well, a couple of different topics. You have solar, batteries, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles got a battery in it. Um, solar is going to go one direction. Battery could go both, either in the car or some battery on a wall. Um, there's not that many today, but there will be tomorrow. And those then become part of a distributed grid. And we have to be able to cohabitate with those. So um, some of it will probably motivate with money. I can see more rates coming out that says at a certain time of day, I will pay you more for, for energy out of your battery onto the grid. And other times I'll pay you less. And conversely, sometimes I'll charge you more to pull energy and put it into your battery or into your home. Um, we're more used to that in the commercial space, but I, I, that has to be a part of it because all of us are, are ultimately um, motivated by money. So you tell me I can run my electric vehicle charger right now, it's totally fine, but it'll cost me 30 bucks. But if I wait a few hours, it's gonna cost me 30 cents. But you're giving me the choice. Um, you can probably guess which one I'll pick in most instances, but how do we light all that up? Um, I, I, as John mentioned, I can see something like Wi-Fi that jumps from the meter to have these quick conversations with these other widgets um, for awareness and maybe a bit of control, but we, we're, we'll have to have a way for utilities to be able to comfortably say, we have awareness of and control of this now distributed grid. Which, which today isn't huge, but it's it's gonna just it's gonna mushroom in the next I don't know five six years. I just wanted to add to that one of the things that I've seen uh, is that the actual model of a utility where it was a top down you know generation distribution transmission and distribution has changed completely now, mainly because of DER. Uh, like John mentioned, DER now has changed to model of a utility to become a broker. In some cases, we're seeing legislation that is actually requiring for utilities to keep close track of the usage and the energy that's being generated in these individual or distributed farms and actually uh, control that and where you define the rates and how you're going to charge the people, but as well as how the utility is going to redistribute that safely 
right? We have to look at it not only from a monetary perspective, where the rates will definitely play a role, but also on how the flow of these new uh, sources of energy can accommodate within the grid to serve areas that need it. So from that perspective, and I think that to the, to the largest extent of the metering becoming a gateway of devices or, or, or communication, not only for home devices, for demand response programs, for example, as we've seen in the past, we can definitely look at it as the device where now allows the communication of those solar arrays, those individual wind farms, and any other form of uh, you know stored energy in batteries, so whatever you see, because of, remember Tesla bringing the wall of batteries where you can actually store quite a bit of it. So that really changes on the communications requirements and the criticality of that information to be shared within the grid. So not looking at it from a, from a commercial perspective, but looking at it from an operational perspective, that telemetry data is very important. You need now a more solid network that will support that type of data. And not only the traditional way of store and forward like AMI used to work, but now is going to be uh, basically almost instantaneous communication at the level of uh, uh, you know, PMU data that you're generating from potentially a large uh, set of homes that are doing that and they have expert capacity. Uh, we've seen in the West Coast in California legislation going towards that. And we've also seen the effects of that legislation where, where you know, unfortunately disasters have occurred like uh, the, the fires that were generated by uh, infrastructure that was not necessarily uh, you know, under the control of the utility. So I think that there are other dimensions outside of the commercial and the actual applications where the AMI uh, or the meter can become the gateway to support that communication. And hence having a technology that provides a more reliable, more robust, more resilient type of communication as well as it meets the latency requirements for all this time critical information is very important. I see that where AMI 2.0 can be a significant player uh, with the new infrastructure. Expanded role, that makes sense. All right, let me, uh, let me go ahead and, and, and kind of shift up or uh, uh, change, change maybe topical direction a little bit. And let me talk about something, maybe some, uh, uh, something very, uh, uh, kind of a basic, and that is with the assumption of uh, if we're switching our uh, our residential metering and we're changing the infrastructure from a from typically a mesh, although not all are mesh, but but a significant chunk are are mesh related, uh, and moving to a private LTE. Uh, one of the most uh, the first question is going to be asking whether, whether if, if I have a private LTE network, how much coverage. How, how much of my network do I have to build out in order to cover the meters that I have? Basically, you don't want to go backwards in terms of coverage. And you want to be able to cover as many, uh, uh, to be able to uh, uh, still support and maintain the, the meter to cash functionality. So you can't go backwards. And so what is the, what is the thought of, uh, there's a couple of different kind of thinking of, of what you could do. One is, going uh, private LTE as a as foundation or as a base, and then using or supplementing, uh, using commercial as, as a kind of backup or as a fill-in. So, so from a, a technical standpoint, it, it, it's certainly possible, but from a, a metering or from a utility standpoint, uh, is, is that a good way of thinking about it? Or, or should we be thinking about things in a different way? Maybe, maybe through uh, uh, alternate, alternate network architectures that can maybe do the same thing. So let me change the order here. Uh, John, maybe, maybe, John, maybe if you wanna talk a little bit about maybe the relationship between private and, and commercial cellular as coverage options. Yeah, sure, I think, I think this is the beauty of industry standards, right? What the cool part is, is that LTE is LTE on both public and uh, <laughs> private. So a great sort of like, uh, harmonization has taken place here where you actually as a utility have a choice and my view is that uh, there are going to be some utilities already spoke to them that plan to deploy private LTE across the entire service territory and their service territory sets up well to do that if you go across to another utility that has five states and a couple of them in the Rockies and it's very sparse population and you're trying to get coverage out there, the mathematics might not tilt in your favor. 
So um, in our particular case, we built based on LTE and given the NICs and the head end the capability to uh, sort of care, not care. So you could have a hybrid uh, uh, private LTE, public LTE uh, solution, and from the head end software, the delivery to the MDMS and the other applications, and from the NIC perspective, you can um, allow both of those to interoperate uh, together. We think there's going to be a fair number, especially as the uh, the, I, the bell curve hits and the IOUs start moving big volumes across. Right, many of the large IOUs have service territories that are expansive and uh, it might work out well for them to have uh, sort of a mix. So uh, my view is it's gonna depend on the utility, but uh, the utility should not be, and I don't believe is, strapped by, uh, with the new standard, strapped by uh, needing to necessarily get that uh, answer perfect. One other move we see afoot is people who wanna wade in which is I have an existing network, it works fine. We're encouraging those companies to continue to milk the living daylights out of the benefits of their existing system. But the realities of some of that stuff dropping off are real and uh, they're getting aged now. And do they wanna put more infrastructure and more meters of the legacy kind in the market or do they wanna start slowly populating their network um, with the new world? And uh, the public LTE sets up well for that until you get to a certain density, and then you can switch over. So if the um, if the uh, network interface cards and the head <clears throat> are architected correctly, we can give utilities that flexibility to sort of make transitional moves over time. You know, all of these things are, are marathons, not sprints, and uh, and get that sort of transition uh, taking place. So. The beauty is uh, we're no longer dealing with, you know, multiple vendors with their own proprietary technologies. We now have an industry standard that uh, we can coalesce around and uh, everybody, you know, that the, uh, the timing will vary by vendor because they've got big investments in legacy technologies and intellectual properties and margins to protect, but it's going to move to to LTE. Kenny, from from your perspective, any any other uh, uh, thoughts or views on the uh, perspective on the the relationship between uh, a, a private and commercial solutions? Um, yeah, you you would um, when if you're going to look at a new deal, one of the first things you'll do is a prop study. All of us that are using radios are going to do a prop study, so you you get a snapshot, a public snapshot, perhaps. Here's where my coverage is of things with the public carrier. And when I roll out my private, here's here's the snapshot of what it's going to look like. So now I know where my coverage is going to be. And by the way, if I don't like that answer, then you have decisions to make. Do you want to spend more money to add a little bit more? Um, but another piece is if you have a mesh or a, or a PLC, for instance, you're going to have to carefully tear it down. You don't want it to collapse on you. So you have to you have to think through how do I tear down that part of town uh, without poking too many holes in the in the balloon so that the balloon collapses. So um, the, the cellular stuff, you can just deploy it like crazy, but you need to be careful how you do it. John makes a really great point though. You need to you get the plan quickly so that you don't continue to spend your investment money on the old thing. Because everything you're, everything you're buying is, you, you are self obsoleting it in a moment. So um, make a way to, to be able to make the switch really quickly for the future. Um, that could be repurposing meter, meters even. You could take them from one area instead of throwing them in the garbage, you could move them elsewhere to keep that doing the old way. Um, but another another great point John made is the ability to, to switch back and forth. Um, if the public is there and the private's not yet, that's fine. Um, we'll talk on what's there. And then later when we're told to do it, we switch to the, to the old one. Um, so it, it gets complicated, but what, what I've noticed, quite a few people have forgotten, not the people on the panel here, but quite a few people have forgotten is you don't want to break what you have. You have to pr protect what you have. And I, I, I think the, uh, uh, I'm thinking of conversations about uh, uh, the migration of uh, moving from say a, a mesh to a, a private, to, a, to an LTE based solution and unwinding that mesh and that that's a, a non-trivial task 
And uh, Kenny, to your point, it's, it's something that you want to be very mindful of. And uh, it, it's, uh, I think there'll be lessons learned and some best practices, no doubt, that'll emerge about how to, you know, essentially go slow, you know, go slow and then go fast is, is kind of the, the, the blunt way of putting it. But, but surely there's a lot of nuances and a lot of uh, uh, ways to do it to, to minimize the amount of disruption that goes on. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the things, so, so talking about uh, uh, being able to move, maybe I'll, let me throw out a question here about being able to, to smoothly move between a, a, a private and a commercial network. And, and if, if we're saying that that's a, uh, an important ingredient, kind of an important flexibility to have, uh, maybe we could spend just a little bit of time about where we are right now and, uh, and, and where, where that is and, and where maybe some additional work might need to go to kind of improve so, so that it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's probably easy to say. You could probably put a PowerPoint together that shows that diagram, but implementation is probably uh, a little more of a challenge. So uh, uh, Mauricio or John, uh, maybe, maybe you could help us uh, kind of explore that space of, of maybe where your experience or where you, your views might be. You want to go first, Mauricio? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think that one of the things that we definitely have learned from, from deployments in the past of AMI is that uh, you know we did deploy a hybrid network uh, with the collector points, for example. We had areas where we covered with our own infrastructure and we had areas that we covered with the commercial carriers. I think that gave us important lessons on the actual type of service that we can expect from, from commercial service. And I feel that uh, to the point that Johnny made earlier, now that we're standardized into open technology, standard-based, it's important to see that while these are the same technologies, there are many ways that you can actually smooth that transition nowadays, not only from a dual SIM capacity, for example, as being one of the, uh, I would say the most uh, uh, rudimentary solutions, going all the way to using eSIMs, for example, or iSIMs that most of the vendors now are implementing in their hardware uh, meters and being able to control those uh, using potentially roaming agreements between utilities and carriers where it makes it very easy to have one single entity controlling the actual act activation and the activation of the devices and thus uh, being able to roam between a commercial or a public or a private network depending on what's available at that point in time. Obviously, there's still going to be costs that have to be paid in order to use that uh, external network. But I feel that the simplicity of moving data from one place to the other is going to attract, and it's already done, and uh, attract a lot of attention for many utilities in understanding how they can connect their potential private networks with carriers to uh, not only benefit from uh, roaming users, but also to ensure the fallback cap capacity and capability that they didn't have before because of proprietary technology. So I think the transition will take, like, uh, uh, like Kenny was saying, a careful in uh, analysis, careful design, and also paying attention to where you want to break something or where you could potentially break something for bringing something new. But I think that having the standard-based technology allows you now to have many more opportunities where you can improve your design and you can actually place this without affecting and thus having a, a successful migration uh, from a public to a commercial or vice versa. Sure. Want me to go ahead and weigh in next, Chris? Please. Yeah, the, um, uh, from my perspective, this has gotten demystified a lot over the last uh, six months. So I'll just share a little bit of my, my experience with the game behind the game. And uh, the game behind the game is uh, you need to have excellent relationships with the carriers, excellent relationships with the chip vendors. You need to have very expensive CTOs and chief architects and product marketing guys. There are a lot of conversations in this space about how to get it done. And there's multiple approaches. I, you know, I'll just give a shout out to one vendor as an example, tell it, who has gone very far now to be able to, uh, as an example, have a single modem that services both public and private uh, LTE. There's still firmware work to do. There's still eSIM work to do. And some of that is still wild, wild west. But the vendor community um, uh, through UBBA and, and the Enterix ecosystem, et cetera, there's work going on now that um, these things are less mysterious 
uh, than they used to be. There's time in the chair, but you have to understand the roadmaps coming from the uh, silicon vendors. You have to understand the software. You have to understand where everybody else is playing. And it's a bit of a Rubik's Cube, but it's not a break the laws of physics thing. And you know, our view is that the meter will be able to go in the ground and self-select. If the private network is there, it'll light up. If the private network is not there, it'll light up on the available single or dual carrier uh, public network. And, you know, that's where our emphasis is um, uh, to allow that to happen. And it's important. This goes beyond electric as well. Right. A lot of the IOU community in the states has electric and gas. You also need to be able to do it on batteries um, in gas transmitters that allow the same functionality to occur because gone are the days where we want to wed a, a gas transmitter to an electric transmitter. Lots of utilities are learning that lesson now in the ability to just have this LTE point to point, public or private, do the same thing with gas is also uh, quite critical. So what we've learned is put smart people on it and build great relationships with the vendor community. Uh, and that's sort of behind us as we're, you know, as we're bringing the products you know, through alpha and beta and in the market. I think that's uh, I think that's that's very interesting. One of the uh, one of the comments. So so picking up on the the gas versus electricity. One of the areas that that I you know if 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 you're only focused on one industry or the other, you know, this is maybe not a, a particularly important conversation or, or interesting conversation. But but the the idea that the the metering and some of the requirements of of what a meter needs is different based on if you're battery or not and and one of those one of those uh, obviously it's it's efficiency and and power efficiency and conservation uh, and and one of the areas where that conversation leads is talking about the kind of air interface let's go ahead and say that it's a, a 3G PP standard what kind of air interface uh, those those meters are are interested in using, and, and usually it's done as a, a kind of a, a, a balancing or a comparison between an NBIoT or a CAD M1 connection. So I'm I'm interested in and in maybe using that as kind of a starting point of of talking about uh, if if you're looking at if you're looking at meters and you start getting into it, that's going to be a conversation that that comes up fairly quickly. And I wanted to, to maybe go around and maybe see, hear from all the perspectives of, of where we are with MBIOT, CAT M1. I, I know the answer is gonna be it depends uh, in the sense of, of what the specific use case and the utility, but maybe we can uh, kind of explore that a little bit more for, for each one. And, and Russ, maybe I'll, I'll start with you on, on that side. If, if that's even of interest or, or maybe, maybe from it's, hey, I just need something that works and that's the detail that I'll let others uh, help drive. Well, I, I, you get back to the the age old. I mean, it's how many eggs can you fit in a carton that only has 12 eggs? Yeah. So, you know, there, there are certain things that you have to look at from a capacity perspective. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great conversation because if, if you're dealing with, uh, and I'll say a limited private infrastructure that let's say you only have a three by three, you, know, you can only put so many eggs in that carton. So from an engineering and design philosophy, you're really going to have to start thinking about those endpoints and what you need from those endpoints to support your business goals and requirements. So while it would be nice to have, you know, uh, you know, again, you know, a cat connection to each one of those things so you can do more of this stuff and get more information out of it and all that stuff, do you really need it? And, right. and if you had that crystal ball, if you start to look at the evolution of these technologies, and I just come back and say, look at where we are, you know, and I'll say from, from the first AMI deployments that we went in, uh, and you're looking at, you know, numbers of meter reads per day, how much information are you going to get on a 24 hour clock? Uh, how does that gas, how does that water information better support? you know, what's your, again, your end goal is going to be, whether it's the buying, you know, the capacity planning or other types of things. So I think it all really comes back to the world of what do we want to do with this information? What do we want to do with this data? What are we going to get out of these things? 
you know, in, in the world of AMI meters, you know, it was we, in our, I say in our day, you know, it was we talked about bellwether meters and bellwether meters that might be at strategic points on distribution feeders, you'd be able to get more granular data, power quality data interfacing with fault sensors and things that you're going to put out on distribution lines. I think those types of things gravitate more towards an NBIOT type of uh, sensor-ish you know, type of, of requirement. So you're, if you start to look at the design of, you know, whether from the meter manufacturer, whether it be from the, the network infrastructure that you're putting in place, how many takeout points and things like that, I think it, it, it kind of builds on top of each other, understanding what those requirements are going to be from any, uh, I'll call it utility, whether it be a gas, a water, or, or otherwise, you know, Battery is battery is an interesting conversation to have when you're putting things in you know class one div one types environments you know that have you know uh, you know the ability to cause explosion you have to be very careful about you know the introduction of you know that so so I, I you know to come back and say one or the other I I think as we've seen you know from a utility perspective over how many years you know the thing we're trying to get against is we don't want to have we don't want this to be a 15th system or a 16th system. We'd like to be able to come back and say this is a wireless system that gives you the opportunity to connect as many of these endpoints into this to really start to get them. You've heard it from the other, you know, you know, the panelists. It really comes back to leveraging, you know, that that single platform, that whiteboard to be able to support each of these things that are there, the use case to make sure that the uh, you know, our customer, whether it be a utility customer or whether it be an internal customer from a utility company who has to do something or reporting functionality. So whether to say one or the other, those are all the things that I have to, I, I would come back and tell you, you have to go into your, you know, decision matrix to come back and say, this is how we're going to deploy these technologies. You know, with small cell technology, I mean, I, the things that you're going to start to see, and I, I will continue to tell this to a lot of our utility executives, I go about and say, it's, you know, it's, it's, we want to leverage our fiber plant. You know, so you get the big backbone and things that we're doing from a utility perspective. How do you best utilize that fiber plant with additional takeout points using the different technologies that the vendors are coming out with to build that PLTE network? Uh, to best support what those things are going to be for us. Uh, hopefully that helps support. And then if the other panelists can weigh in. I'll just say from our perspective on the endpoints, um, you know, we're, we're deploying battery operated CADM in water at scale today. We've, we've knocked out that battery issue problem. Uh, the math works. And, um, from our perspective, uh, on electrics, we're supporting CADM and MBI2, MBIO2 both, because uh, some utilities may have some preferences, as Russ mentioned. Uh, but we, but mostly we're doing it because the, some of the carriers have preferences outside of of uh, and inside of private LTE. You may have a carrier who says, "I don't want that much uh, CATM traffic on my network." I want those devices to be NBI2, and if you want to play in my patch, then uh, we want that solution to be NBIOT. So from a systems integration and vendor perspective, right, the, the key is how do I get multiple of those things spec'd correctly, get the vendor community behind it, and have something that's flexible enough that can meet, um, you know, multiple kinds of applications. But uh, from our perspective on water and gas, we've already hit the battery problem in the head. Yes, yeah. yeah, same here. But, um, we've, we've got water, gas, and electric use in the same radios. Um, of course, water and gas are going to have a lot less to say, but that that radio should last 20 years on that little bit of energy in that battery, which is stunning to me. You know, coming up with a few decades of electronic experience just Imagine that we're actually pulling that off, and it's it's not a PowerPoint; it's real. Um, to, to what John said, we we're doing CAD M1 because that's what the carriers have, but that's that's an area I'm working. I'm selfishly caring about the Americas, but other guys at the company are worrying about the rest of the world. Turns out they use electricity all over the whole planet. Who knew? 
and and that's a mixture there of CAD in one and um, NBIOT, but it's a little potato potato. We don't much care um, which way which way we would go. The radios will be the basically the same um, basically the same hardware. But in in North America and in central in Central America, it's it's CAD in one. Yeah, to the point that Kenny's making, quite a few people in the world are using Narvana IoT for water and gas metering. We've actually seen that, especially for water metering. And uh, we participated in a lot of those deployments for both carrier-based and private-based networks. Uh, here in the U.S., I think most of the interactions that I've had with vendors of hardware, uh, it's because the modules for CADM were available. So I think that's, again, like I mentioned earlier, it was one of those benefits of uh, uh, basically inheriting the technology that was developed for commercial networks and it's put it to play into private networks. So from that perspective, even though uh, you, you have several limitations because of spectrum availability, say uh, three megahertz, for example, or a band that it's very particular on how it operates like CBRS and uh, being TDD and FDD, that makes the actual technology of narrowband IoT and CADM not necessarily very um, uh, available and flexible. However, I think that uh, that is going to continue change to change because we see a, a lot of, uh, of these new vendors coming in into trying to not only become competitors for the houses that already have most of the majority of the utilities, but they're in the process of changing and seeing how they can improve their offering by you know, using that scarce resource, which is spectrum. We've seen that as being one of the key uh, determinants of what technology to use, is how much spectrum you have available, how many use cases you want to put out there, and obviously, what's the ecosystem that's available for that? So, yeah. Hey, Chris, just before we leave this topic, there's one other uh, sort of element to this, which is um, uh, for a lot of the electric utilities, right? There's the other side of the coin, which is LTEM doesn't get me home. I now want to stream video. I now want to move big amounts of data from DA equipment across, you know, serious DA routers. And this is where the multi-application part of the network comes in, where we can allow them to have LTE8 and have, you know, high performance and, and take the DA stuff outside of the metering network, still on the same network network, but not dependent on limitations of the meter to move higher performance applications on a multi-application network and being able to go the other direction with um, with both commercial and technical solutions is key to unlocking some of these. Because at the end of the day, things move when uh, you know utilities don't buy products; they buy operating benefits. So we've got to be able to connect all of this stuff up with how they can get new recurring benefits out of their network, and uh, being able to scale up as well as down is key. I, I think that, that, that's a good point. So, so the the, uh, 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 the the idea of being to go beyond uh, what whatever a, a CAD M1 connection and going into a CAD 8 or or higher performance uh, because you have broader needs and broader uses and being able to have that flexibility in the technology. Uh, to be able to do it. If we had more time, Marisa, I'd probably ask some more questions about how infrastructure can support some of these things simultaneously, even in a private network. Uh, uh, and again, always being mindful that you have constraints around spectrum and the capabilities that that, that and restrictions that that might introduce. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to ask that. Uh, we are uh, just about five minutes, so uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to ask Bobby. Do we have any uh, do we have any questions that might have come up? I, uh, I I I wasn't looking at my chat here, so I uh, I don't actually know the answer to this question. <laughs> well, um, thankfully, we have gotten a lot of questions, but you guys have answered a lot of them in your dialogue. Um, so there's just a couple of nuances from a few of the questions I wanted to ask. A couple of them were very similar, and I think it has a bit to do with. Um, the availability of spectrum and the ability for a large number of meter deployments, 800,000 to a million meters talking over private LTE. Um, do you see that as a, the capability? Is that the kind of numbers that we're talking about? Mauricio, I'll, I'll let Mauricio. you do it first slice. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sure. Uh, you know, I remember back in the day when I was working at og and &E and uh, we had deployments with collectors that were supporting between three to 5,000 meters per collector. Uh, collectively, they went up to about 1.2 million, the ones that we had in our uh, area of coverage. So the numbers uh, back then for that technology that were supported, we very easily support now with narrowband IoT and CADEM. So I don't think that there's a limitation on the capacity of how many meters you want to run. It goes all down to the point of, well, obviously how much spectrum you have and how many other um, use cases you want to run to the point that John was making. Right now, it makes sense to deploy a network that will support multiple use cases, and some of them require more bandwidth than others. So I feel that a combination of LTE and narrowband IoT or LTE and CADM, and if a spectrum is available of all the three, is plausible with any system that we deploy right now. And again, constrained by spectrum, but that should be a capacity that would be very easily achievable without having to break or having to bring additional systems. So we are well within, uh, one of our customers has about 5 million water meters that were deployed within a single private LT network. And that's to the point of water metering. Granted, the uh, constraints on how much data it's gonna go from a water meter versus a, a utility meter, electric utility meter are very different, but the capacity is, 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 is nearly limitless. I would say. That's right. And, and I, just to just to write a coattail on that, Mauricio, that that also the issue of density, right? So so capacity over a geographic area, and then there are questions about density and and how much you do with you know, how much you can how many you can handle in a sector and, and some of those requirements as well. So so obviously an important consideration during the uh, system design. Yeah. Thank Any you other? So oh, go ahead, Bobby. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say one other one, and I think you guys talked about it a little bit, but I think um, this asker wanted to, to press a little bit, really around um, how you're seeing wireless chipset for under the glass meter, under the meter glass, um, being adapted, replacing that uh, legacy mesh network, um, you know, timeline. We all talk about um, pushing forward the chipset manufacturers on the device side, but particularly meters under the glass, um, this person was asking about pros and cons and timelines of that. Any comments there? Is that you're asking, can, can we do this today right now with uh, with meters? I think it's, if it's not right now, or what kind of timeline horizon are you looking at? Yeah, we had it yesterday. We've, we've, we've had it for a while. Um, the, the scale is not massive yet because people aren't quite ready, but they're, get, they're getting there quickly. We have quite a few very large deals that are beginning that will wreck those numbers up huge. Um, but th from the meter perspective, we're finished. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Chris, I'll turn it back to you since we're in the final minute to do your final one minute wrap up. Sure. So uh, I. In, in terms of wrapping up, I know we covered a lot of ground. First, I want to thank the panelists, Russ, John, Mauricio, Kenny. I think this was uh, a, a productive discussion, one that I know I enjoyed. And I know that uh, uh, we could, uh, looking at my list of, of topics, we could probably go another hour here uh, of, of diving into where, you know, into the different topics and, and covering the different ground. I appreciate your flexibility of, of going through this. From an audience perspective, I hope that we've covered uh, it, at least started addressing some of the questions that are of interest. I think that it's, it's clear that there's uh, uh, one that, as Kenny said, that, that we've certain parts of the solution have arrived and, and there are known quantities, as John alluded to, uh, problems are being resolved, problems that, that maybe a year ago or, or years ago or ha have been addressed and viable solutions are out there. Uh, and we know that it's uh, through time that we're going to get there. So. A lot of, uh, not everything's solved, not everything's done, but that uh, we're well on the way and uh, interested in making more progress. If, if anybody has any additional questions, I know that everybody on this panel would be interested in addressing those questions. So, so reach out to, to one or all of us who, who if, if you do have anything from an audience perspective, Bobby, I'll take a look at that, uh, that question list as well to see if there's anything else that we need to go you know, address. Uh, but other than that, again, thank you, everyone. And Bobby, I'll, I'll hand it back off to you to uh, sign off.
Great, Chris. Well, thank you guys all so much from UVBA. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I could see um, a follow-on uh, series of webinars to continue this conversation, clearly one of great interest to not only our members, but to the entire industry around the world. We've had people from all over the world tuning in. So thank you for that. Um, we will have this recording um, available on the UVBA website uh, within a week or so, and uh, we will follow up with those questions. So thank you all so much. Have a thank good you. day. Welcome. Good day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Be well.